and he uh, he is not backward in for in coming forward with his political beliefs. He does it a lot, and uh, he's very verbose about it. And uh, oh wait, yeah, yeah, Funkhauser's back. Yay! I'm back. I'm back. You got that? You got the dog call. I got the dog call. How, how's that? What do we do? We have a progress report on Scruffy. How's everything going? Homeboy's gonna lose ten teeth today. Oh, that's a lot of teeth. Ten but he is. Teeth. He he's fifteen years old, and the fact that um. 15, right? Yeah. He, he, the fact that a 15-year-old dog has uh, 10 teeth to lose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive. You know, like, I, I think it's a, uh, um, I, I think the fact that he's going to lose 10 teeth is a tribute to his dental fortitude is what it is. So, uh, continue sending good vibes to Scruff Dog. Um, so, actually, let's get back into the news. We'll do the, the uh, we will do the Vince Vaughn thing for a second. We just wanted to make sure Funkhauser could be kept up to date on the situation with our little hero, Scruff Dog. Yes, now let's go back to Mariah Carey, thinking about uh, her. Mm. Have, have, during the break, and when talking about your dog's teeth that are going to be extracted, <laughs> did you manage to make a decision between, uh, did you manage to make a decision between Sarah Palin and Scruffy? Well, I mean, sorry, <laughs> Sarah Palin and <laughs> Scruffy, absolutely <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's like, you know, the conversation probably leading up to and uh, afterwards will be totally different between the two. So, I don't know. I think getting Sarah Palin in a vulnerable state and then asking her questions post-coitus you know, would be fun. But you, you, You'd enjoy the after splash. I would have ulterior with Sarah motives, Palin. though, I think, yes. <laughs> with Sarah Palin. I just thought of, uh, you know, I, I, um, I just made my decision. I, uh, I, bearing in mind the voice that comes out of Mariah Carey's mouth and uh, the voice that comes out of Sarah Palin's mouth, I'd want to stick something in Sarah Palin's more, so I'd go with that just to just to shut her up. If I was going to have to spend time around her in this scenario, I'd be like, oh, for the love of God, just put the keep keep your mouth busy. Let's go. So I just decided Sarah Palin. Oh, okay, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. But that way, it would be more like. It'd be a defensive move. It'd just be like, "Oh my God, shut your, <laughs> shut your, <laughs> shut, shut everything." Your, yeah, just shut. Well, yeah, shut your moronic mouth. Just shut your idiot, blathering, hate spewing, awful, uneducated. Uh, shut your knuck. Sh- shut your troglodyte whore hole, and uh, then I'd be uh, good to go. Like, if I could get her to be quiet, that would be better. Yes, the, that, that's what I was trying to sum up. Shut your troglodyte whorehole, Sarah Palin. Put this in there. Let's go. I've decided. Between you and Mariah Carey, I, oh, I'm such a martyr. Such a martyr. Never take the easy way out. Never take the path of least resistance. Given the option between Sarah Palin and Mariah Carey, just to get her to shut her retarded whorehole, I would go <laughs> with. <laughs> I would go with Sarah Palin. Can't say that three times, five times fast, can you? Sarah Palin, shut your retarded whore hole. <laughs> if I was campaigning politically against her, that would be my, start, that would be my, start a chant. That would be on every button. That would be my. <laughs> that, that would be on every button. That would be my campaign slogan. You, you'd spend hours punching those buttons. You'd, yeah, vote. For, <laughs> this message brought to you by the people for shutting Sarah Palin's retarded <laughs> whore hole. Go on. Lionel Richie says he and his bandmates in the Commodores used to have sex with three girls a day. Yeah, so when he sings all night long, I guess he means it. Yeah. Good job. Now I get but, say alone, honey. Uh, <laughs> Don't tell me where you're going either. Hello, is it me you're looking for? Uh, go on. What about him or him? <laughs> um, Tracy Morgan says he doesn't think he can ever be funny again. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean... It, it, I mean, it was really sad when I heard him say that. Like, yeah. clearly, you know, the the damage that was done to him uh, in the car crash was way more than physical. Uh, but, um, yeah. Did you he, see he the Today he, Show uh, interview in full? It's like eight minutes oh, long on YouTube. Depressing. Yeah. It's really tough to watch. I, like, I love Tracy Morgan. I really do. Like, I think he's one of the most naturally funny people on the face of the planet. Like, he can't not be funny. You know, I mean, but... Whew. Yeah, it it, it just whew, the the damage he suffered was definitely more than just the physical damage. And it's crazy. On the upside of things, if Tracy Morgan says he doesn't think he can ever be funny again, he'll fit right in back on Saturday Night Live. Go on. <laughs> uh, Dennis Rodman says he'd love to go on a date with Caitlyn Jenner. 
<laughs> uh, when told of Rodman's interest, Jenner immediately began the process of transitioning back into a man. Go on. <laughs> uh, Johnny Depp is endorsing a new line of cologne. <laughs> yeah, so it's great news for everybody who wants to smell like they used to be able to carry a movie. <laughs> Uh, oh, they remember me? <laughs> uh, what were some Johnny Depp movies? That de- well, Pirates of the Caribbean. Those are the big ones, right? Yeah. Where did it all start to go downhill for him? It was Lone Ranger, wasn't it? Where he played Tonto. Yeah, probably. Yeah. If they had an Oscar for most insensitive, racially insensitive casting, that would have walked away with it. Uh, I do know that. For John- go go ahead. On? You, you first. Yeah. Okay, oh, okay, just... I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I know about Johnny Depp is he uses, he listens to music when he does his scenes yeah. in his earbuds in his yeah. head. That's weird. Yeah, I guess you know. Well, I mean, I, I, do you think he does it when he's talking? Yeah, the I whole time. I he can must see be that. listening to the wrong music. <laughs> yeah, I could see that though because like. You know when you're uh, you're watching an action scene in some sort of movie or a love scene, whatever the hell scene, the, the background music that is setting the mood for said scene plays such a big part of it that I can't imagine being able to kind of picture it without the appropriate music in the background. And if I could, I could understand why Johnny Depp would listen to music as he tries to set a mood for a scene. Yeah. Fortunately for Depp, with this new cologne he's endorsing, even if it's the worst smelling cologne ever, nothing he does will ever stink worse than Mordecai. It's just you and me and feeling stronger every day. In July, 600,000 Jam Watkins Glen for Summer Jam, the largest rock festival ever held in the U.S. It features the band, the Grateful Dead, and the Allman Brothers. And in August, those same Allman Brothers released their first album after the death of Dwayne Allman and had their only hit single with Ramblin' Man, which goes to number two. Listening to iHeartRadio for more from 1973. Coming up. iHeartRadio goes one on one with Mike Rutherford to discuss the art of songwriting. I've learned one thing over the years is that actually you can't control it. You can't force it. You can't analyze it. You can't worry about it. You just go and have a good time and mess around, and then something comes along and you grab it. You know, you, you, it's something intangible. And if you try and make a program on how to do it and do it better, you get lost. So I just, it's, it's like a free form thing, which you just, you can't control. You just let it ride or not ride. And if it's not working, then you just have a break. That's what I've learned. Keep listening to iHeartRadio for more Mike Rutherford and all your favorite artists. Delivering fascinating subjects, interesting talk, and boobs and fart jokes. AD on iHeartRadio. All right, Funk Hazard, a couple more pieces of news, and we'll talk guns with Vince Vaughn. Yes. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld recently said he doesn't mind if people make fun of the series finale of a sitcom. Mm. In that case, what is the deal with that finale? Who likes Green Day? (laughs) 
I actually rewatched it not so long ago. I didn't think it was all that bad. I yeah, think they did a great job of like bringing back every single actor that had ever been on the show ever. And, you know, like it didn't go out with a tremendous bang. Like him doing comedy in prison was, you know, it, it was sort of, it, it was what it if was. If they had done but, a movie afterward, would you have seen that? Of course. I, I would see, I'll see anything that Jerry Seinfeld does. Like, I even watched a couple episodes of that game show he had, The Marriage Ref. Whoa, that wasn't Whoa. good. That was, no, that was not good. What was the deal with that? Um, so, yeah, no, I, I would watch anything Jerry Seinfeld is, and I'm a huge fan. Didn't you say uh, Jason Alexander? George, was he was on Howard Stern the other day, right? Yeah, and he went into detail on who, uh, who was uh, up for that role of George. Uh, and it was, it was Seinfeld's best friend, Larry Miller, right? Yeah. Uh yeah. The the legend goes with that one that he thought he had no chance of getting it cuz he saw Larry Miller was up for the part as well. He knew that Larry Miller and Jerry Seinfeld were best friends, so he thought, "Okay, I'm just a pawn that the studio's using to get Larry Miller's asking price on this down." So, um he went in and he said he did a really bad Woody Allen impersonation, like signals Jerry signals and um and left and to Seinfeld's credit, um, rather than hiring his best friend, like Larry Miller was his best friend then, and I believe is his best friend now, rather than hiring Larry Miller to uh, be on the show, Jerry Seinfeld just went, that's our George. And he, uh, he he did what was good for the show, which is, I think, you know, it just the integrity of that particular decision dictated the tone for the entire thing. And that's one of the many reasons why it did so incredibly well. Did you see that in the interview with Stern, um, he talked to, you know, George in Seinfeld, Mary, it, like he's he's engaged to marry that uh, that executive from NBC, Susan. Yeah. And um, she dies because she licks envelopes. And George wanted to go with the cheaper envelope, which had toxic glue. So she licked like 500 of them to send out their wedding invites and dies. That is one of the most incredible, pivotal, defining Seinfeldian moments. And you know why? You know why they killed her off on the show? It, it wasn't because it was written out that way and it was going to be awesome. What happened was apparently, like, Jason Alexander, George, said that uh, the woman who played Susan was really nice, like, totally got along with her, but acting with her, he said, was just terrible. And he didn't want to, like, have her, mar- didn't want to be married to her, have her written into the show and have to, like, deal with her, you know, like, at all times. And so um, apparently they were all set to be married and that was going to be the plot. And uh, one day after shooting with her, like, and, and the rest of the cast had this experience too, they sat down to lunch and they were just like, ugh, is she the worst or what? So then they <laughs> decided to kill her off, which, ah, oh, it's got to be terrible because the the woman that played Susan back in the day, the woman that played Susan back in the day must have like, she was like, oh my God, I'm going to be written on to the biggest television show ever is going to be great. I'm going to be a regular, not just a recurring role. I'm going to be a part of the cast. It's going to be fantastic. And so they kill her off. And and to add insult to injury, 17 years later, they're like, yeah, the reason that happened was because we thought she sucked as an actor. (laughs) Yeah, that's got to hurt, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little insensitive of Jason Alexander to talk about it that way. But, oh, well. Can't put toothpaste back in the tube. It's out there. Oh, it's an awfully big monster ball out there, my friend. <laughs> uh, alrighty then. Let's uh, let's talk about guns. A little something, shall we? Um, if you think that you're going to be able to disarm America, and, and there's all these arguments, and believe me, I'm familiar with the ins and outs of them uh, regarding gun violence. And countries don't have them, you know, and everybody looks at England and goes, hey, they don't have guns over there. And look at the number of people that um, are killed by guns. It's way, 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 way less statistically and proportionally as much smaller percentage of the population is killed by guns in England. And then, you know, people over here will raise the old argument of, well, gee whiz, um, the number of guns there is smaller, but the incidence of violent crime is much higher. You see, if they had guns, the violent crime would come down because, you know, click, click is the worst deterrent to a burglar that exists. And that's what Vince Vaughn thinks. Vince Vaughn told the British edition of GQ magazine. I mean, maybe he was sort of like, 
English people look at guns in America and go, this is ridiculous. And so maybe he was being defensive in terms of Americans having guns. But Vince Vaughn told the British edition of GQ magazine that he's in favor of gun rights. Way, way in favor. He said he wanted.